Hey, good morning. We're so glad to have you guys here in the house and watching us online. Holy smokes, this is a fun day. Let's all stand. We'll start worshiping together. There's a hope for all who's gone astray. There's a road for all who's lost their way. There's a light that leads us back to grace. Forever shine, it never fades. There's a Bible stirring in my heart. Since you love unlocked these prison bars, I'm a slave no longer to the dark. Forever change, forever yours. Oh, Jesus, you're my mercy flowing through my veins With every heartbeat I can feel your grace it's a freedom I cannot explain forever change forever yours oh Jesus your thank you that you are freedom, our hope, our everything lies with you. We take this day, ask you to make it yours. We want to honor and glorify your name. It's in Christ's name I pray. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated.
I guess it's okay. <laughs> Good morning, what's the name? Uh, uh, well, we, we, we want to pray for our friends in Ukraine. You know, I uh, have a lot of uh, ups and downs with what's going on. I mean, you, I get my hopes up because you hear about them taking, you know, advancing. And then, I mean, it's just like a roller coaster ride to me. Talking to t talking to the people over there, and it's uh, you see all the baptisms, and uh, they're having. I mean, people come in to get to be baptized and to accept Christ as their personal savior by the thousands. It's just amazing what's going on over there. Uh, but in the back of my mind, I'm thinking, you know, here we're looking forward to getting rid of summer, um, but over there, I mean, they have winter. Just really, uh, I guess, praying that something miraculous happens that this gets res you know resolved and because I can see the um, loss of life on both sides uh, with winter. It's it's just uh, boggles my mind on the, how many lives are going to be taken and the suffering that's going on. That being said, uh, would, you, would you pray with me? Uh, Father God, we uh, just come to you, Lord, and just lift up the, our friends in, in Ukraine, Lord, and the people of Ukraine. Uh, ask you to give them strength, guidance, uh, comfort, protect the families that are there, Lord, and the children. And uh, We just ask you to uh, rule with the mighty hand, Father. We put our faith in you, and we know they do. Just ask you to continue to uh, keep their spirits up and their hope, Lord, and, and just not to be uh, beat down with this with this uh, onslaught that uh, Russia is just coming at them with, Lord. Uh, thank you for all you're doing there, and and thank you for the ones that got saved, Lord. We give you the praise and the glory, Father. Uh, just uh, continue to ask for the hearts here, Father, to continue to support Ukraine and in their efforts, Lord. I pray this in the name of Jesus Christ, your son. Amen. Question, what if the strong and the powerful are not always what they seem? And what if the unbeatable are not always what they seem? And what if your struggles and challenges aren't always what they seem to be? Over the next 10 weeks, we are going to spend some time looking at one chapter of scripture, and we are going to learn from the biblical account of a man named David and a man named Goliath, and we are going to learn how to overcome obstacles, succeed in challenges, gain victory from defeat, and for some of us, once and for all, defeat the giants that rule our lives. Right on. And today, I'm glad you're here today because today is a very, very foundational day. We're going to just kind of lay the foundation for the next 10 weeks. Um, and to lay the foundation, there's really two parts. Like if you're going to lay a foundation, you're going to pour some concrete. You've got to also have some forms and some rebar. So I'm going to give you some forms and some rebar that we're going to build this series on. And the first one is we all have giants. You might not face a giant named Goliath, but you've got some battles to fight. You've got giants in your life, and if you're not aware of it, let me be the first to tell you. You've got giants in your life. 
And you, you need to learn the skill to defeat them. Now, your, your giants are probably not named Goliath. They're probably named something like my past, my reputation, my failure, my addiction, my broken relationship, debt, self-righteousness, hurt, habit, hang up, cancer, misplaced priorities, money, failure. You have a giant or two or 12. We all do. And Goliath was armed with an incredible sword and massive javelin. And you're giant is probably not armed with either one of those things. He's probably armed with stuff like doubt, loneliness, anger, depression, fear, anxiety, laziness, complacency, apathy, hate, bigotry. The list could go on and on. The truth is you have a giant. And I don't know what giant you're facing today, and, and I don't know how they attack you, but I know you've got one, because we all do. Because we are all fallen human beings, living, living in a fallen world, and Jesus made this promise to us. It's one of the worst promises Jesus made. He promised, in this world, you will have trouble. So if you're alive today, in this world, you have trouble. And many of you have giants, and we're going to learn over the next 10 weeks how to defeat them. The second part of the foundation this morning is that our traditional understanding of the biblical account of the David and Goliath story is fundamentally flawed. The story you heard growing up in Sunday school, in VBS, on the Veggie Tales, is incomplete at best skims the surface and leaves us, if we're not careful, it will leave us with a flawed understanding and more importantly, a flawed perspective of this account and what we are supposed to take from that account. See, the story we tell is a, is a story of an enemy so large that no one could stand against him. The story we tell is of an enemy so strong and so powerful that no normal person could defeat him. The story we tell is of an enemy who's so intimidating, so unbeatable, so long undefeated, that it's probably just best not even to tangle with him. The story we tell is only someone who is reckless and a little bit crazy would even dare to fight the giant. The story we tell is the hero has to make a one in a billion shot if this is going to work. And the story we tell is it just has the most unlikely of outcomes. In fact, the outcome is so unlikely that it's almost unbelievable. And there's probably a part of us that doesn't believe it. And when that's our understanding, when that's the story we tell, what happens is our perspective about our giants begins to be influenced by that story, by the surface story. And we will begin to think, and some of you are thinking today, your giant is just too strong and powerful for a normal person like you to fight it. Some of you sitting here today, some of you are thinking, you know, I'm not sure I have the courage or the bravery to risk everything on a one in a billion shot. So I'm not even going to try. And when our perspective is flawed, it's just easy to give up on the idea that I could ever defeat this giant. See, I believe right now today, those of us in the house and those of us watching online, far too many of us today, we are dwelling with our giants instead of defeating them. We are dining with our giants instead of defeating them. We have chosen to have the perspective that it takes a reckless hero and it takes that reckless hero, a one in a billion shot. I'm not sure I'm reckless. I'm not sure I can pull it off. It's better just to not fight the fight at all. 
and we start to live with and dwell with and dine with our giants. And I'm telling you today, friend, you don't have to. You no longer have to live with, entertain, listen to, be influenced by, or fear the giants in your life, whatever they are. We're going to learn over the next 10 weeks that your giants aren't as strong as you think they are. You're not as weak as you think you are. It doesn't take reckless bravery or even great faith to take them down. And it certainly does not take a one in a billion shot to win the fight. So I hope you'll join us for all 10 weeks because we're going to break all that down in great, great detail. Uh, and to do that today, just in case you didn't have perfect attendance in Sunday school, you didn't make it to VBS, or God forbid you didn't see James and the Giant Peach or whatever the VeggieTales version was, David and the Giant, David and something, just in case you haven't heard the story or just in case you're not familiar or just in case it's so familiar that you have that flawed fundamentally perspective, we're going to read the whole story today, not little bits and pieces of the story, but we're going to read it all. 58 verses. Come on. 58 verses. Oh, we're clapping for verses. I love it. Thank you, Mike. Appreciate that. There is so much to be learned. and We're not going to read all 58 verses for all 10 weeks. We, there's just no way. But we have to today to lay the foundation. Here's the concrete. I gave you the forms. I gave you the, the rebar. Now here's the concrete. Here's the biblical account of two men, David and Goliath. The Philistines, they mustered their army for battle, and they camped between Sakah in Judah and Azekah in Ephes Damim, and Saul, who was the king of the Israelites, he countered by gathering his Israelite troops near the valley of Elah. So the Philistines and the Israelites faced each other on opposite hills with the valley between them. And lest you get caught in the trap of thinking this happened somewhere far away and it wasn't real, it's just a story we tell. This is, this is verifiable by science. You can go and stand where the Israelites camped and you can stand where the Philistines camped and you can walk up the valley of Elah and next week I'm going to show you five little smooth rocks that came out of the valley of Elah. You can go and stand there right now. And here's a better picture. You are standing on the spot where David would have stood as he faced Goliath. You're standing at the place where the Israelites camped and you're looking across the valley of Elah and you're looking at the hill, the mountain, where the Philistines would have had their camp. This is a real story, guys. This is not some made-up fairy tale. These things happened. Then Goliath, a Philistine champion, from Gath. He came out of the Philistine ranks, so he, he came out of the, the, the hill. He kind of marched down the hill a little bit to face the forces of Israel. He was over nine feet tall. Pause and time out because um, that is, that's humanly possible for a human being to be nine feet tall, but understand that nobody in the Bronze Age had a tape measure, and the way you measured anything was the, the distance between your wrist and your elbow. This is how most societies measured things, and probably, Matt, your wrist to elbow is not quite as long as mine because I have freakishly long arms. And so it really, it, it's very subjective. Some scientists say, well, Goliath was probably six foot 10, six foot 11. He could have been that short, and he could have been nine feet tall. Both of those things are within the realm of possibility. We do have documented facts of human beings being that tall and growing that tall, so it's not at all um, outside of the scope of being possible. But just understand that compared to the average Israelite, even if at his shortest Goliath was six foot ten, he was enormous. He came out, uh, he, he's six foot nine or he's nine feet tall. He wore a bronze helmet. He had a bronze coat of mail, not like mail that you read, but sewn together chain. Uh, and he w the, just that coat weighed 125 pounds. He also wore bronze leg armor, and he carried a bronze javelin on his shoulder. The shaft of his spear was as heavy and thick of, as a weaver's beam, tipped with an iron spearhead that weighed 15 pounds. If you don't know what a weaver's beam is or how that might look, don't worry, we're going to show you. But imagine a spear with the tip that weighs 15 pounds 
pounds. My brother is um, a college track coach. He, he coaches the throwing team at Arkansas State, and the shot put those guys throw, 16 pounds. So imagine a college shot put on the end of a stick, sharpened to a razor point. This is the, the armory that this man carried. His armor bearer walked ahead of him carrying a shield. Goliath stood and shouted a taunt across to the Israelites. So he, he stood at the, the very end of the hill and he shouted across the valley to his enemies. Why are all you coming out to fight? I'm the Philistine champion. But you are only the servants of Saul. Choose one man to come down here and fight me. If he kills me, then we will be your slaves. But if I kill him, you will be our slaves. I defy the armies of Israel today. Send me a man who will fight me. When Saul and the Israelites heard this, by the way, Saul was the king, when they heard this, they were terrified and deeply shaken of this nine-foot-tall man with giant sword and giant spear defying them, taunting them. Now David, he was the son of a man named Jesse, an Ephrathite from Bethlehem in the land of Judah. Jesse was an old man at the time, and he had eight sons. Jesse's three oldest sons, Eliab, Aminadab, and Shemiah, had already joined Saul's army to go and fight the Philistines. David was the youngest son. How many of you have a young brother, little brother? Yep, yep, I got one too. I don't know if he's watching today or not, but all little brothers are the same. Y'all are all the same. You're about to find out. David's three, you know I'm right, right, old brothers, older brothers? Yep. David's three oldest brothers, they stayed with Saul's army, but David went back and forth so he could help his father with the sheep in Bethlehem. For 40 days, don't miss that detail, okay? For 40 days, the same scene repeated itself over and over and over. Every morning and evening, the Philistine champion, twice a day, he would strut out in front of the Israelite army, and he would say the same thing. Y'all are dogs. You can't fight. Just send me one man. If we win, you've heard his taunt. One day, Jesse said to David, take this basket of roasted grain and these 10 loaves of bread and carry them quickly to your brothers and give these 10 cuts of cheese to their captain. <laughs> See how your brothers are getting along and bring back a report on how they are doing. David's brothers were still with Saul and the Israelite army at the Valley of Elah, quote, unquote, fighting, there was no fight yet, right? They were just all kind of lining up, looking at each other, screaming at each other. Uh, they were still there. So David left the sheep with another shepherd, and he set out early, in the, early the next morning with the gifts as Jesse had directed him. He arrived at the camp just as the Israelite army was leaving for the battlefields. So they were leaving their tents, walking down the mountain, overlooking the valley of Elah. Uh, they were shouting. They were all excited. It must have been a good day. It must have been about day 12. 13, maybe 20, before they were too depressed and too defeated to even bother fighting. They were all excited, shouts of battle cries. Ah, oh, we're going to get them this time, boys. This is our day. Soon the Israelite and Philistines, they stood facing each other, army against army. We do this every day. David left his things with the keeper of supplies and hurried out to the ranks to greet his brothers. As he was talking with them, Goliath, the Philistine champion from Gath, he came out from the Philistine ranks, and David heard him shout his usual twice-a-day taunt to the army of Israel. And as soon as the Israelite army saw him, they began to run away in fright. Have you come to see the giant, the men asked? It's kind of a circus show at this point, isn't it? Have you come to see him? He comes out each day to defy Israel. The king, get this, the king has offered a huge reward to anyone who kills him. This is probably one of the most mis, maybe overlooked parts of this account, that the king actually sit, sets out a bounty. Whoever kills the giant, 
can marry the king's daughter, which automatically puts you in line for the throne, and your whole family will never get a bill from the IRS ever again. Holy cow. I mean, that's enough, right? That's enough. Should be. That should be enough. Your whole family is exempt for the rest of their life from paying taxes. David asked the soldier standing nearby, what? What, uh, uh, what, what does a man get for killing the Philistine and, and ending his defiance of Israel? Did he really just say, I, I can marry his daughter and live tax-free? Well, who is this pagan Philistine anyway that he is allowed, he is allowed he is allowed by God's people to defy the armies of the living God. And these men gave David the same reply. They said, yeah, that's, that's what the king said. Marry his daughter, live tax-free. But when David's oldest brother, Eliab, heard David talking to the men, he was angry. What are you doing here anyway? Aren't you supposed to be with the sheep? You, you just came here because you're prideful and you're full of deceit. You just want to see the battle. That's why you're here. <laughs> and David's like, well, what have I done now? I can't ever make you happy, big brother. Little brothers, you with me on that one? Yeah. What have I done now? I was only asking a question. And so he walks away and he walked over to some others and he asked them the same thing. And he received the same answer. Then David's question was reported to King Saul. So the king sent for him. And here's what David says to the king. Hey, king, I know it's been a, a month or so. Don't worry, about, don't, don't worry about that, Philistine. Don't worry about it. <laughs> don't worry about this Philistine. I'll go fight him. Don't be ridiculous, Saul replied. There is no way you can fight this Philistine and possibly win. You know why Saul thought that? Because he falls into the same trap that you and I fall in when it comes to our giants. All we see is how big they are, how loud they are, how powerful they are. He couldn't see what David saw. There's no way you can win. You're just a boy. And he's been a man of war since he was a boy. But David persisted. He said, I've been taking care of my father's sheep and goats, and when a lion or bear comes to steal a lamb from the flock, I go after it with a club, and I rescue the lamb from its mouth. I can fight this giant. I beat up a lion. I beat up a bear. What's the big deal? Uh, if, if an animal turns on me, I catch it by the jaw, and I club it to death. Cool. Cool. I've done this to both lions and bears, and I'll do it to this pagan Philistine too. <laughs> For he has defied the armies of the living God. The Lord who rescued me from the claws of the lion and the bear will rescue me from this Philistine. Amen. Yeah. Saul finally consented. All right. It's been a month and 10 days. What do, we, what do I care? You know, so somebody has to go fight. Go ahead. God be with you, because <laughs> that's your only hope. So then Saul gave David his own armor, a bronze helmet, a coat of mail, and David put it on, and he strapped the sword over it, and he took a step or two to see what it was like, for he'd never worn such things before. He's just a shepherd. I can't go in these, he protested to Saul. I'm not used to them. I've never used these before. So David took them off again, and he picked up five smooth stones from a stream, the stream you saw in that picture, right in the middle, which still flows today. And he put them into his little shepherd's bag. Think fanny pack. I wasn't brave enough to wear a, my fanny pack. I do have one, but Barry's here, and Barry makes fun of me when I wear my manny pack. Then... Armed with only his shepherd's staff and sling, David started across the valley to fight the Philistine. Goliath walked out toward David with his shield bearer ahead of him and sneering in contempt at this ruddy-faced boy. Am I a dog? He roared. 
that you would come at me with sticks? And he cursed David by the name of his gods. Come over here and I'll give your flesh to the birds and wild animals, Goliath yelled. And David wasn't having none of that. You come to me with sword, spear, and javelin, but I come to you in the name of the Lord of Heaven's armies. How dare you? The God of the armies of Israel whom you have defied. Today, the Lord will conquer you. And I will kill you. And I will cut off your head. And then I will give the dead bodies of your men to the birds and the wild animals. And the whole world will know that there is a God in Israel. And everyone assembled here will know that the Lord rescues his people, but not with a sword and spear. This is the Lord's battle. And he will give, it to, he will give you to us. It's a great account, isn't it? See, see, what you can't experience is you can't smell Goliath. David is close enough to Goliath to know what he had for breakfast. David is close enough to this giant of a man to hear him wheeze and gasp as he speaks. These are words on a page for us, but this young man is on a dusty battlefield face to face with a giant. and a stick, and some rocks. <laughs> As Goliath moved closer to attack, David quickly ran out to meet him. Reaching into his mani pack and taking out a stone, he hurled it with, thank you for laughing at my dumb jokes, he hurled it with his sling and hit the Philistine in the forehead. The stone sank in, and Goliath stumbled and fell face down on the ground. This fight was over before it began. So David triumphed over the Philistine with only a sling and a stone, for he didn't even have a sword. Then David ran over and pulled Goliath's sword from its sheath, and David used it to kill him and cut off his head. When the Philistines, when the Philistines saw that their champion was dead, they turned and ran. Then the men of Israel and Judah gave a great shout of triumph. It's about time, right? They, they, they shouted in triumph, and they rushed after the Philistines, and they chased them as far as Gath, where they came from, and to the gates of Ekron. The bodies of the dead and wounded Philistines were strewn all along the road from Sharaim as far as Gath and Ekron. And then the Israelite er army returned and plundered the deserted Philistine camp. I love this detail. <coughs> David took the Philistine's head to Jerusalem. Come on. He, he was taking home a trophy. He, he took that man's head from the valley of Elah and marched it up to the highlands and left it in Jerusalem. But he stored the man's armor in his own tent. He's going to make a few bucks later off of this stuff. As Saul watched David go out to fight the Philistine, he asked Abner, the commander of his army, both of these men should have been the one in the fight, by the way, Abner, Whose son is this young man? I really don't know. He was in your tent earlier. Maybe you should have asked him. Um, Abner declared, well, find out who he is, the king told him. As, as soon as David returned from killing Goliath, Abner brought him to Saul with the Philistine's head still in his hand. <laughs> Tell me about your father, young man. Saul said, uh, and David replied, well, his name is Jesse and we live in Bethlehem. Now, uh, as you look at this account, there's so much to see. And, and the story we tell is just so surface, 
and it's really easy to miss the important details. So that's what we're going to do for the next nine weeks. We are going to learn Bronze Age warfare and why it's important today. Um, and one thing you're probably very familiar with is this thing, this concept called single combat. Um, if you've ever watched any sort of movie about ancient times, you've probably seen one warrior say, hey, you send out your best and I'll fight him and whoever wins, well, that's the winner. This was a real thing. This happened a lot in history because it would spare a lot of good men their lives. Two armies would face off and somebody would say, you know what, why don't we just have the best warrior from this side fight the best warrior from this side and everybody else will be okay uh, with the outcome. Whichever warrior wins, that's the winning team and we'll all submit to that rule. Single combat. Two sides try to avoid massive bloodshed by choosing one warrior to represent each side in a fight to the death. Now, I think this is a good plan. I would pay good money to see Vladimir Putin and my man Zelensky in a cage match to the death. Winner gets Ukraine. I'm showing up to that fight. I don't know if you've watched any news. Zelensky is, I mean, he is jacked up. He is bulking up. He, he could take you out. It, it was a brilliant thing to, to spare husbands and sons and fathers, just thousands of them dying if one warrior was willing to fight from each side. Now, I don't know if you're aware of this or not, but this has happened for you. The greatest thing about single combat is if your warrior won, you won. If your warrior won, you won. You didn't have to do anything. In fact, by the rules of the game, you couldn't do anything. You just had to stand there and trust that your warrior was the best warrior. And that when he won, so did you. Now, I want to fast forward because the greatest warrior who ever lived took on the greatest giant that has ever existed, stood face to face, toe to toe with the greatest giant any of us have ever heard of, and he won. Giant's name is Death, warrior's name is Jesus. When he, Jesus, came to the village of Nazareth, his boyhood home, he went as usual to the synagogue on the Sabbath and he stood up to read the scriptures. And the scroll of Isaiah the prophet was handed to him. So Jesus starts reading. He unrolled the scroll and he found the place where this was written. The spirit of the Lord is upon me. For he has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim that captives will be released, that the blind will see, that the oppressed will be set free, and that the time of the Lord's favor has come. He rolled up the scroll, he handed it back to the attendant, and he sat down. And all the eyes in the synagogue looked at him intently, and then he began to speak to them, and he said, this scripture that you've just heard, it's 700 years old, it has been fulfilled this day. And of course, Jesus was speaking about himself. And Jesus would leave that moment and he would have an amazing three-year ministry. And towards the end of that ministry, our warrior stood face to face, toe to toe, with the greatest enemy anybody has ever faced, death. No one had ever beaten him. Death was undefeated from time beginning. No one has ever gone single combat, face to face with death, and won. And what's crazy is, just like every giant, every giant does this. Every giant makes huge 
colossal mistakes. See, the giant death made the mistake of assuming that the cross was the end of the fight. But Jesus knew the fight wasn't scheduled for another three days. And at the end of those three days, Jesus cracked open the tomb and cut the head off of death forever. Amen. Defeated death. One man against the greatest giant the world has ever seen. Our warrior won. And if you're on his side, you also won. You win. You didn't do anything. You couldn't do anything. You just have to be on his side. Now, I'm getting way ahead of myself. Uh, I want to go back to, um, to the Valley of Elah because Goliath made one big, huge, enormous, colossal mistake. This is what giants do. They're so big, and they're so strong, and they're so powerful, and they're so undefeated, and they're so intimidating that they can't see straight. They have tunnel vision. We're going to see in a couple weeks that Goliath literally could not see straight. See, Goliath was expecting this single combat. He was expecting a warrior like himself to come fight him hand to hand, face to face, sword to sword, shield to shield. He was expecting Israel to send another infantryman like himself with a helmet, with a coat of armor, with some leg greaves, with a, sh with a shield, with a sword, and with a spear, and we're going to stand in this circle till one of us is dead. That's what Goliath was expecting. Now, I'm going to give you a spoiler alert. Okay? I'm going to tell you why our understanding of the story on one level is fundamentally flawed. And here's the spoiler alert. And you're going to think as soon as I say this, you're going to think, whatever, dude. Come on. That's not right. You're going to think that I'm making this up. You're going to think when I tell you the spoiler alert, I don't think so. I don't think that's right. And the reason you think that, the, the reason you're going to take this spoiler alert and just kind of write it off as preacher talk or exaggeration or whatever, the reason you're going to think this is because you are a 21st century American who has never fought single combat on a Bronze Age battlefield. If you had ever stood on a Bronze Age battlefield, you would understand this account in a whole different light. Here's the spoiler alert. The moment, the, the moment that David stepped off of that mountain and down into the valley and broke ranks with the warriors and stooped and picked up five stones, the moment that dude took off his sling off of his waist, the moment he started to sling this thing around, every warrior on that battlefield knew, as Mike would say, oh, four-letter word inserted here. Oh, no. If you were a Philistine and you saw a young man approaching your champion with this, you in your brain would have thought, we're in big trouble. If you were on the Israelite camp and you saw David take off that crazy king's armor and just pick up his sling and you saw him take this out of his holster, you would have thought, that Goliath, he's dead. This ends today. This battle is over. There is no way Goliath can win this fight. And if you come back next week, I'm going to tell you why. Everyone on that battlefield knew the fight was over, that Goliath had no chance. And guess what? The same thing is true for you. If you can learn to think like David, if you can learn to act like David, if you can learn just to get into his perspective, your giant also has no chance. When you fight the way you are intended to fight these battles, your giant will fall. All your giants will fall. And I would change the word from will to must. There is nothing your giants can do to defeat you when you learn the skill and the art of defeating the giants in your life. I want to pray for you. We're going to worship. 
we'll pick back up next week. Lord God, help us to see things clearly. Help us to trust your perspective. Help us never ever to measure the size of our giant against our own strength, our our own abilities, our, our own thinking and our own opinions. Help us to always measure our giants against you. God, I know there are people here today who are struggling, wrestling, fighting, who can't seem to quit. They can't seem to win. They can't seem to ever get victory. Please show us what it takes to be free. Your words were that captives would be set free, that the oppressed would be set free. May we be free people. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Man, it's not hard to ask you to stand and just worship together. What a great God.
know, the giants will fall when you stand on, the God, on our God, his word. We're going to continue to worship. There's no one like our Jesus. just just thank you for your son and the story that you tell in your word you had a plan you had a plan for us the giants in our lives cannot stand in the face of your plan for our lives God as we leave this morning let us take the stones of faith God and just face our giants down as your word goes before us, stays with us, and it has our back. Thank you, God, for your son, Jesus. It's in Christ's name I pray. Amen. Thank you. You guys are dismissed.